we go. There we go. All right. So for those of you who can't see Scott, there's a picture of him as well. Um, so our, our guest speaker today is, is Scott Davis, uh, ex Reading current player, is that correct? That's the one, mate. It is indeed. Many thanks for joining us today um, and taking some time off uh, time out to, to do this. I'm sure you agree that in the current climate, um, mental health is going to be very, very important. Uh, mental well-being and the importance of things like this um, can't be under underestimated. Yeah, of course, it's massive. Yeah, especially with what we're all, what we're all going through at the moment. Um, I was going to say it's nice to get some time off from the uh, the fiance mate. So an hour an hour tonight's quite nice. <laughs> So the, the format today, if that's okay, is um, to do a couple of questions and feel free to, to talk uh, as much as you want. We want to hear your story today. Um, and then I've got a very quick presentation um, and then uh, we're going to open it up for, for question and answer. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for everyone who has um, put in a question already. We've got four or five to, to, to basically start that section off. It's great. Um, but if anyone else obviously does have any questions, please do ask them. We want it to be as interactive as possible. So um, for those of you that might not know Scott, Scott is, it, is it possible potentially, I'd like to start right at the beginning because you are local to Berkshire and Buckinghamshire. Um, I believe you grew up in Aylesbury. Yeah, yeah. So um, obviously I was born in Aylesbury, um, moved to Stoke Manville in my sort of younger years um, and then 16 years old. Um, left house and home, moved over to Reading into Diggs, um, which I'll obviously go on to in a bit um, when I explain my story in Hull. Um, but yeah, my dad played football um, in Buckinghamshire for 25 years, semi-professionally, Ellsbury, Marlow, Chesham, um, for a long, long time. So not just the professional clubs in, in Barks and Bucks, um, but non-league too. I've sort of done my rounds from the age yeah. of sort of two or three watching him. Um, and yeah, the love for, for, for football was, was there from the very beginning. Brilliant. Um, any any of the local Aylesbury teams you play for as a grassroots? Yeah, my my uh, first ever team was Bedgrove Dynamos. Um, so it's quite a successful side. Um, Dave, who's obviously on here uh, watching tonight, will know that five or six of the lads from that Sunday League side. I was quite fortunate. We all went over to Wickham um, at a young age, and we actually made that transition together, which made it so much easier. Uh, it felt as though we were playing in our Sunday League side, but at a professional club. Um, so fitting in and the transition was was, was kind of seamless. Yeah. So how did it all start at Reading? How did you get scouted maybe in the L? Yes. So um, eight or nine years old, I was playing for Watford um, and the centre was shut down. Uh, it was like a centre in Aylesbury. Uh, they couldn't afford to fund it any longer. And Wickham said that they were going to take the centre over. So I sort of had an opportunity to go to Watford on trial um, or stay with my mates and, and crack on at Wickham. And that's what I chose to do. Um, I was there for four or five years until the age of 14 and I remember walking home from school one day um, and my dad said to me that Nas Bashir had been on the phone, he just recently got a job at Reading, um, who was one of the coaches at Wickham and he said listen we want to take you over on trial and I remember the first session that I went over on trial, I left there thinking do you know what I'm nowhere near these, these lads levels, they're bigger than me, quicker than me, stronger than me and the thing out of all of those things I thought they were better than me. So straight away, I thought to myself, do you know what? I preferred being sort of a big fish in a smaller pond um, than being just a number in a bigger pond. And a few months down the line, um, I was fortunate that compensation was paid um, and I went over to Reading. I remember going to school the next day and telling all the girls because uh, I thought to myself, do you know what? Um, I want people to know about it. It was a good ego boost. Um, but then I suffered with uh, stress fractures in my back from the age of like 14, 15. So I was out for pretty much a year was getting out of bed in the morning, going to school, but I was crying. I was in absolute turmoil in terms of the pain. Um, but fortunately for me, because they paid the compensation, um, they obviously saw some sort of talent, I suppose. Um, and for me, I was quite fortunate that it gave me a scholarship. So off the back of that scholarship, it meant moving out of home at 16 because I couldn't afford to commute from where I was living in Ellsbury. Um, there was no way of getting there. There was no direct train or bus route. So I remember packing my bags, crying my eyes out, leaving my parents thinking, do you know what, I've got to do it because from the age of five or six, all I wanted them to do was play football. Um, and I moved in with a fantastic family. Um, Ali and Mark were their names. They had a little girl. And I remember the first night going to sleep thinking, this is so strange. Like, what is this going to be like? 
And for me, there's only so much TV you can watch. There's only so much, uh, so many computer games you can play. How so old I were needed you to. Play? So I was 16. I was 16. Okay. Um, so it was only four days after my last sort of GCSE. I remember sort of uh, my mates were going away, having good summers, long summers before sixth form started. Uh, but we were straight into the thick of things with football. Um, so there was no respite. And then, um, yeah, I was lonely and big, so I won't. I'm not ashamed to admit it, that I was homesick, I miss my parents, I miss my friends. Um, and where I was living, there was lads scattered all around Reading, but I was kind of isolated where I was. Um, there was no one else nearby, and I thought to myself, I hear of the lads getting together after training every night and going to play PlayStation, going for a kickabout down the park or whatever it may be. Um, but where I was, it was it was kind of by yourself and just sort of get on with it. Um, but what I found difficult off the back of that was obviously boredom, um, not much to do. So I started to walk to McDonald's out of all places every single night um, and get myself a McFlurry. Um, and on the way back, I remember going into the bookmakers one evening. I was two years younger than what I should have been. And I sat down um, on the sort of uh, chair in front of the fixed odds betting terminal. I was only earning £50 a week. That was my scholarship money. And I remember losing it um, instantly. And I thought, what have I done? Um, I thought to myself that I could win some money, but I couldn't. I walked outside the shop, I rang my mum and I said, listen, um, I've spent £50 pounds, uh, on a pair of trainers this afternoon in the shopping centre. Can you lend me some money? Straight away, she transferred me some money over um, and I lost hers. And I thought to myself, well, that needs to be a learning curve. I need to sort of stem the flow of gambling already. Um, but little did I know I was going to go on and spend uh, nearly a quarter of a million pounds on it over the next 10 years, um, which obviously crippled my mental health. So that was the beginning of it. Um, I feel like I've got a question coming. Um, yeah, well, we're not too dissimilar in age. I remember quite vividly um, going through some, some similar things. When we were 16, 17, the, the, lure, the, the, the gambling industry was very much there. It was so very easy. Um, I got kind of, was there, I don't know how to say this, but um, how did it, from obviously 16 with 50 pounds, obviously, escalate that yeah so well the, the thing that happened off the back of that was i'd wake up in the morning i didn't have one pound 20 to get the bus into town um to go and meet Whopper, the minibus driver um i don't know if, how many of you know him but obviously works at the club for years and i used to bring up the physio it was a, a, a lady called mel and i'd say listen mel i don't feel well i'm not coming in today but the reason why i wasn't going in is because i thought to myself i don't want to have to walk into the town center which used to take me about two hours to go and catch the bus um, because I couldn't be bothered. So I'd skip training. Um, the following day I'd get to training and I'd get punished for it because I'd turn my phone off and just put a face down and go back to sleep. So that's how I dealt with my problems um, at the beginning. However, some mornings uh, we were quite fortunate that where I lived in Calcott in Reading, um, we were actually training at Bradfield College, which was probably about three or four miles um, through the hill and up the hill. So I remember leaving one morning to get to training at half past four. Um, I put my rucksack on and I walked to training because I'd obviously gambled my money away. Um, but I didn't learn from that. I just carried on doing what I was doing, thinking that gambling would get me out of it. It would give me a nice life. Um, but fortunately for me at the time, I was actually doing quite well on the pitch. Yeah. So all of that was kind of masked. Um, got pulled into the manager's office and they said they were going to give me a professional contract. And I thought to myself, do you know what? Whatever I've got going off the pitch, um, I haven't got any money in my account and I'm, I'm sort of a bit, bit down and a bit homesick. All I need to focus on is my football. Um, and for the first probably seven or eight years after that, I could get through it um, until one day it all just hit home with me. Um, and I thought to myself, I can't carry on living this life. So um, yeah, it was very tricky at the beginning. I remember 18 years old, I got pulled into Steve Coppel's office and he said to me, listen, you've been fantastic uh, for the U team this season. You've done well in the reserves. He sat me down though and he said, I've had to discipline you a couple of times this season already. Um, he said, you've been shooting players with BB guns around the training ground, just something you don't do in a professional environment. I uh, wouldn't ever recommend it to someone. But that's the kind of person I was. I was Jekyll and Hyde in my behaviour. Um, and I thought to myself, it was just the, the norm. It was the right thing to do. I went on a night out a few weeks later with my friends um, and a lad came and touched me on the shoulder and tapped me. Uh, and he said to me, have you been texting Hayley? And I knew that who Hayley was. It was his ex-girlfriend. Um, Dave actually coached him with me at Wickham. So um, I was like, yeah, I, I have been texting Hayley. He wasn't too happy about it. Um, and he actually punched me, which broke my jaw. So that, for me, um, put me in a right pickle. I remember going to training on the Monday morning uh, with a broken jaw. 
Steve Copper walked past me down the path and he said, listen, come and take a seat in my office. So I sat there like a shrinking violet in the chair and I thought to myself, how is this going to end? He said to me, listen, you've got one year left on your contract. Um, he said, you've obviously been involved in something at the weekend. I don't know whether it was a fight or you've been assaulted. To go and save your career, you need to go to the police. You need to press charges to prove to us that you haven't been fighting. So it didn't really sit well with me yet again. Um, I went to the police and the lad got done for GBH with intent um, and he should have gone to prison. Um, but I didn't want imprisonment on him because I'd obviously had my part to play in it. Yeah. I went back to um, the club uh, the following pre-season thinking that everything was going to be rosy. Um, and he pulled me in again. He said, listen, I haven't forgotten what's happened. Um, he said, you're going to go out on loan for the whole of next season. Um, you're basically going to go and grow up um, because I don't want you around the place. And I got a phone call from uh, Martin Cole, who was my under-16 manager at Reading, but he was also the assistant manager at Aldershot um, Town Football Club. And he rang me up and he said, listen, we've uh, agreed with Reading that you're going to come on a season-long loan um, and it's going to start in the next couple of weeks. You're going to come and do pre-season with us. And I remember driving out of training, being absolutely devastated, thinking, why am I going to Aldershot Town? My ego told me I was better than that um, because I was quite an egotistical young lad. Um, and I remember driving there and they were putting all over social media, welcome to our football club. And I was deleting it off my page and I had fans adding me on Facebook and writing on my page, welcome to our club. Um, and I thought to myself, do you know what? I was quite embarrassed. Um, and that's just me being honest. Looking back now, it was the best season I've ever had in my life. It was the most enjoyable season. Um, and it was probably the most, um, most I ever learned from a season. But during that year, it was tough, like very, very tough. Um, I remember I had three red cards in this 15 games through suspension. Um, I, my girlfriend was pregnant at the time, um, which was out of my hands. We'd broken up. Um, she told me she was pregnant about three or four weeks later. So even that for a young lad was hard to deal with. Um, I basically didn't have a say in what was, what was going on, what's happening. Um, I'd written my car off on the way to a match on Boxing Day, and I don't know how I got out alive. I went flipping down the road in a car. But the thing that hit me the most was that I lost my best friend's uh, mum through suicide. Um, and that's where uh, every time I talk about it, my face goes numb, uh, gets tingles in my face. I remember sitting at my girlfriend's house one day and I got a phone call from him. Um, and he said, listen, my mum's gone missing. Uh, can you come and help me find her? So I was like, yeah, of course. And I remember my girlfriend kicking up a fuss, like saying, oh, I can't believe you're leaving me. And I said, I need to go. So I got around the house and I found um, these tea towels that were soaked with blood in the kitchen. Um, and I thought to myself, what have I just seen? I shouted up to him, have you been in the kitchen? And he said, no. Um, immediately we went down the hospital where my mum turned up and came and met us. And the doctors and nurses had told us that she'd self-harmed that day and she was due back in the following morning for plastic surgery. And we stood there in kind of a state of shock. Um, we went and looked around all the local train stations that night because she'd been found there before. Uh, but we went to bed about one o'clock. The police told us to stop searching. Um, 20 to five in the morning, they knocked on my parents' door. My parents then knocked on my bedroom door where I was lying in bed with my mate and I could hear my mum crying. Uh, we went downstairs. There was two police officers uh, in long jackets and hard hats. And they said to my best mate, we're sorry to inform you, we found the body of your mum and it's not good news. And I remember standing there feeling numb. Um, he didn't have any emotion. He'd lost his dad five years previous to this. Um, and I thought to myself, do you know what? I need to be there for him. Um, and, and, I, and I was for the majority of the time. He's like a brother to me now. However, I went to training that morning. I didn't speak to my manager about what had gone on because it's not what lads do. It's, you don't open up and you don't show a sign of weakness. Um, but he pulled me in about three days later. And he said to me, Scotty, he said, what's going on? And I sat in a chair opposite him in his office and I just started crying. Um, and he just said to me, he said, I know there's something. And I told him exactly what had happened a few nights pre, uh, prior to that. He said to me, go and have a few days off. He said, we'll sort of come back, he said, and we'll kick on again. So I thanked him for it. And that's exactly what I did. Off the back of that, I probably did the most deceitful, dishonest thing in my life that I've ever done. Um, it's not the biggest thing in the world because my mate would understand. But he had some money in his account a few months after that. And I was driving out of training. I was gambling every single day. And I'd run out of money because that's what gamblers do. I rang him up and I said, listen, I've had a car accident. I've crashed into the back of a FedEx van. I said, can you lend me £500 uh, if possible? He uh, transferred me the £500. I went straight to William Hill. I lost the £500 immediately. Still to this day, I've never told him the truth that there was never a car accident. I made a car accident up in my head um, to be deceitful, to be dishonest, to be able to get money off him, which just shows a level of desperation um, where I was. And that was at 19 years old. So I didn't stop until I was 27. Um, but yeah, obviously the story continues. I don't know if you want to mention anything off the back of that while we're on that subject. I know it's obviously something that's huge. Um, I sat with my mum in the kitchen probably a month or two after. Yeah. And uh, 
my mum said to me, she said, I just wish I could have done more for her. And I just said, well, yeah, we all do, but we didn't know how bad it was. And that's the problem. We, that's why we want people to talk out and speak about it. We thought that she was, we thought that she was struggling with her mental health, which was true and it was correct, but we didn't know how bad. And that's why it's so important to actually be honest with people so we can help. If anyone does watch this, whether it's now, whether it's um, off the recording and you listen to this, there's so many people out there that are willing to listen um, and you won't get judged for it. People say that showing a sign of weakness is a sign of strength and courage. And I truly believe that because I did it in 2015 when I actually uh, went to rehab and I was scared about people's opinions of me. I was scared that my parents would judge me. Um, I was scared that my friends, my peers would judge me. Um, but in the end, I thought, you know what, just brush it off and get on with it and tell people your story because it might help a few people along the way. And that's exactly what I did. Yeah, I, um, that, to, to be honest, that's really where Talking Tactics actually started about 18 months ago. Um, someone that I played football with for my entire school career and was very close to, um, he, he took his own life and it really did. Um, go through many of the things you spoke to. I wish I could have done more. I wish I could have spoken to him a little bit more. We've, we've grown a little bit different distance because I've just been around the world and it, with coaching and things like that. And um, But every time I went back at Christmas and, and things would always meet up in that environment. And it was really difficult. And then through Fox, Fox um, they said, what could we do to potentially use football as a, something to talk about? And, um, and then talk to Tactics and Reading FC were very quick to come in as a partner and, and basically use Reading FC as the, uh, the majority stayed in the players' lounge where we'd normally meet as a, um, as a host venue to, to bring that together. But the idea was just to talk about it. And yeah, of course. No, it's massively important. Um, obviously, I'll crack on with the next bit now. And if anyone did want to interrupt and stuff, I'm more than happy to. So obviously that season that I was on loan at Aldershot, um, I ended up scoring 11 goals in 24 games and we won the league by 15 points. My first ever away trip of Aldershot, um, I remember sitting down at the back of the bus and I idolised uh, the captain there, it was a guy called Nicky Ball. And he shouted down the front of the bus, listen, do you want to play cards? And I was like, yeah, of course I do. Um, it was an easy way to make friends. So I went down the back of the bus and within about an hour or two, they nicknamed me the cash machine. Um, not for the right reasons, it's for the wrong reasons because um, I had to get off at the service station, uh, which was about an hour and a half into the trip. Um, I had to go to the cash point and withdraw money. After that, I didn't have any money in my account, so it was all on um, an IOU sheet where you wrote it down. And I'd lost £2,000 in the first two and a half hours of playing cards. I remember going home the following evening, and I said to my parents, that, listen, I've, I've made a mistake. Um, I said, I've lost £2,000 uh, playing cards. And my mum turned around and she said, how have you lost £2,000 playing cards? You haven't got £2,000. You're on £400 a week. It just doesn't add up. So I was just like, I know. I said, I need to pay it by next Friday. Um, so can you help me out? And she said, absolutely not. I knew how my mum worked. I went upstairs. I printed off a payday loan sheet. that was going to cost me £6,800 uh, to pay back £2,000. I left it on the kitchen side, knowing she'd find it, um, knowing that she would come and consult me about it. And that's what she did. Um, she saw it and she said, there's no way you're doing this. Uh, the following day, there was £2,000 in an envelope. And it said, Scott, in big capital letters, do not gamble with a big exclamation mark. And I thought to myself, do you know what? I'm not going to do this anymore. Um, I didn't realise, obviously, that it wasn't going to stop there. Um, I went back to Reading at the end of the season, having had a good year. And my wages went from £400 to £1,800 with a £20,000 signed on fee. And I thought to myself, do you know what? I feel rich. Um, I thought to myself, I'm now living the life. Um, I'm earning over £100,000 a year with bonuses. And the day that money hit my account, I remember stopping in um, Cressix in High Wycombe at the Coral Bookmakers. And I put £3,000 through the machine uh, in about an hour. And I thought to myself, if I don't stop now, I'm going to lose every single penny of it. I went down the hill to Volkswagen. Um, I was met by a car sales guy. Um, and he said, Scott, he said, how can I help you? Because I knew him for a friend. I said, I want to buy a car. And I said that I wanted to buy a car for the wrong reasons, because I knew that if I bought a car, I'd have something to show for it. So 45 minutes later, I spent £22,000 on a Volkswagen Sirocco. I went home with the paperwork. My dad met me at the back door and he said to me, what have you done? I said, oh, I bought a car. And he said, why? He said, you can't even afford to put fuel in your tank. He said, we've been paying for you to get to training for the last year. He said, this doesn't sit right with me. Knowing what my dad's like, um, he went upstairs, he packed my bags, he brought my bags downstairs and basically said, you know what, go and live your own life. I'm sick to death of you making consistently bad decisions. And that was another wake up call, but I didn't learn from it. 
The following year, I went back on loan to Aldershot, um, scored 14 goals in 32 games in midfield um, in League Two. So I've got 25 goals in my first 56 games. And I remember the manager pulled me in one day and he said, listen, do you know you've got um, the best uh, goal scoring ratio for an English midfielder after Lampard? So I was just like, oh, that's great, it's brilliant. And every time I went back into training at Reading throughout the season, um, all the first team players used to call me Gerard. So I used to think to myself, well, what a nice sort of comparison between the two players who I idolised. Um, and every time I did, did play football, I felt like I was doing well. Um, halfway through the year, there was talk about signing for Everton for half a million pounds. And I believed all the hearsay. And that meant my respect money went out of the window. The following year was an opportunity of a lifetime, uh, which I'll tell you about now, where I went back to Reading. Uh, Brendan Rodgers came in as manager. And I'd had him as my UT manager for about three or four months when I first joined. Uh, but he got the job at Chelsea, ended up coming back to us. Uh, we went on a pre-season tour to Sweden uh, and he sat me down and he said, listen, he said, you've had a fantastic tour. Um, you're going to start the next match, which was at home to Chelsea. I remember scoring a free kick against Petr Cech, uh, celebrating like it was a World Cup winner. Um, but it was a special moment for me and no one can ever take that away in front of 24,000 or whatever it is. I remember going sliding on my knees thinking, do you know what, this is great. I went out that evening. I was in a bar in London. And for the first time in my life, I felt as though... Um, I felt as though I was like a celebrity or famous and I was far from it, don't get me wrong. But two guys in a bar tapped me on the shoulder um, and they said, was that you? And I turned around and I looked at the TV screen and there was highlights of the pre-season matches um, going around. And I was like, yeah, yeah, it was. And I liked that. I liked it. I enjoyed it. And I thought to myself, this is great. And I thought it was going to last forever. Uh, the following week, I played against uh, Nottingham Forest, made my debut in the championship, played against Newcastle away uh, after that, uh, Swansea away, Sheffield United at home. Uh, and I got pulled into the office by Brendan and he said to me, listen, he said, I look at the players out there, players like Gilfie Sigurdsson, Harold Robson Carnu, Jem Karajan, and I used to look at them and think, do you know what, they're so busy, like they've got no other life apart from football, all they do is hang around together, they're there early in the morning before everyone else, they're there later on in the afternoon, I've, I've already gone home, I've got a date every single day, not with a nice little blonde, but I had a date with the bookmakers, because that's all I think about, from the moment I woke up in the morning uh, to the last thing at night, that's all I did. So I skipped off to the bookmakers, um, having promised Brendan that my attitude would change. But I knew it wouldn't change because I obviously was occupied with other things. The day later, he saw me rushing out of training. He wasn't even off the training pitch and he pulled me in um, and he sat me down. He said, I gave you one opportunity. He said, and I stopped him in his tracks. And I said, well, I said, I had the dentist yesterday. That's the reason why I had to leave. So he threw his phone across the table and I caught his phone. Um, and he said, all right, son. He said, you ring him and prove it. And I thought, what am I going to do? What am I going to say? Like, there was no dentist appointment. I'm not saying it was the sole reason, uh, but from that day, I never played another match. I was never in another match day squad, having lied to my manager. Um, something you just don't do as a young lad. I had an opportunity there to turn around, tell him that I was struggling with gambling, but I didn't want to tell him that because I thought to myself, do you know what? If I tell him I'm struggling, he's not going to pick me. All right, he doesn't want players that have got issues going on off the pitch. On that Saturday, we travelled to Barnsley. Um, and I got to the stadium. And Selby, the kit man, chucked me a big jacket and said, oh, you're not in the squad today. So I thought, how's this happened? Like, I know I've sort of had a bad week with Brendan, but I still thought he'd pick me. My parents turned up at the game. My dad walked into the concourse with my mum, and they saw me sat in a jacket, and my dad said, what's going on? I was like, I don't know, so I just haven't been picked. And I didn't tell my mum and dad the truth for years after that. I, my, obviously, my career peaked, and it went downhill immediately. Um, but I didn't want to tell them. I thought to myself, do you know what? I'm too ashamed to tell, tell them. So I ended up getting kicked out on loan. Uh, Brendan didn't want me around the club. And when I went on loan, it was one of the hardest things because you're living in hotels, you had not much to do. Um, I went on loan to Bristol Rovers first and that didn't go well uh, because of my gambling yet again. So we had Leighton Orient away on Saturday. Uh, we got beat 4-1. Uh, there was a guy called Dave Penny that was the manager. And he said, listen, no one is going out tonight. We've got MK Dons on Tuesday night. So we got back to Bristol quite late and I had £700 left in my bank account. And I tried to get online uh, to put some bets on. And this old hotel I was living in, the Wi-Fi was awful, so I couldn't really do what I wanted to do. So I jumped in my car, I went to the casino, um, and withdrew the cash. I lost the £700 in a matter of half an hour, 45 minutes or so. But I liked being in the environment. So when I was in there, they started to give me beers and vodkas. And I was thinking, I've got my car with me, so what do I do? Um, but I carried on drinking. I was slid behind all the people playing blackjack and roulette because I got a buzz out of them playing it. About quarter to four in the morning, I got in my car um, and I drove home blind drunk, uh, which I'm obviously not proud about and I don't condone. Um, I got back to the hotel. 
I walked up the stairs and as I was walking up the stairs, I was wobbling all over the place and I fell into a door on the left hand side. Um, when I fell into the door, I kind of shut it and walked back along the corridor to my bedroom. And I went to training the following morning. The manager pulled me in and he said, what did you do last night? And I said, oh, I just had a McDonald's. I said, I'm match a day. And he said, are you sure about that? And I said, yeah. I said, positive, why? And he said, all right, come with me. I went downstairs and he had his, um, he had his phone in his changing room um, and he showed me CCTV footage of the hotel. I didn't realise that night that the assistant manager was staying at the hotel and actually fell into his bedroom door. Um, where he was staying with his wife. So I got to obviously caught out lying yet again. Um, but I look it back now and think, well, if I didn't need to go and have a bet at the casino, I wouldn't have left my room and I would have been safe. I would have been, I'd have been sound. Um, but he basically told me to go and pack my bags and get back to Reading. When I got back there, I sat down opposite the manager. Um, I think it was now Brian McDermott because it had changed over. Um, and I sat down and he said, what, what's happened? He said, you've sort of come back a week too early. And I was just like, I didn't like the boys. I didn't like where I was staying. The football didn't suit me. The food was awful. And I blamed everything other than myself. And I knew that the common denominator was me. I knew that I was the issue. Um, I then went to Wickham, the club that they that sold me at 14. Gary Waddock had then joined Wickham, who was my manager at Aldershot. And I gambled the most I gambled in a day off the back of the foot match there because of something that didn't go my way. We played Leeds United away um, on, uh, on the Saturday. After the game, we draw we draw one all. Um, the chief scout at Leeds uh, rang me up and said, "Listen, we're interested in taking you." Uh, this was on the Monday. Would it appeal to you? And I was like, "Yeah, of course it would." Um, so I told my dad, I told too many people, told my friends, uh, my agent, and it didn't um, it didn't go through. Um, they ended up signing a lad called Adam Clayton rather than me, who now plays for Middlesbrough. Um, but at the time, he was on loan from Manchester City to Leeds, and I thought he's a similar age, similar position. There's another opportunity gone. I went to what I believed was my safest place. I jumped in my car um, and I went to the bookmakers. I lost £10,000 in the next hour and a half. That was £10,000 that I couldn't afford to lose. I had, that was my last £10,000 or my last pound I had in my account by the end of that day. I remember getting home, uh, having been sat in my car at the, the row, uh, sorry, sat in my car at the row of shops, crying my eyes out. People walking past and looking at me strange. And I thought to myself, do you know what? I just want this pain to stop. I just want this pain to stop, but I don't know how. For the first time in my life, I Googled um, how I could stop, and all the answers are too long-winded. You need to go to this meeting, that meeting, you need to talk to this person. And I thought, I haven't got time for this. I ended up getting released at the end of the season. I got my comeuppance, um, and I got a phone call from Steve Evans, who was manager at Crawley Town. He'd actually had a fight with my dad in the car park um, when I was playing for Aldershot. So we beat Crawley in a match, um, and Steve Evans came out, and he started like verbally abusing me. And my dad was stood about 10 yards away, um, he obviously didn't realise this, so they ended up sort of squaring up in the car park, and I thought, I cannot believe, I'm sort of two or three years later, he's ringing me, trying to sign me. So it was quite surreal. But he sat me down and said, listen, I want to make you um, my first sign of the season. Um, I want to basically financially reward you. Um, so he gave me £30,000 to sign that day, which was incredible amount of money for League Two. Um, but all it enabled me to do was gamble even more. The £30,000 went into a savings account with my parents. My mum was now looking after my bank card because she'd seen I'd obviously transacted £10,000 in a day. So I was treated like a child. Um, I was left sort of £20,000, £30 on the side each day. But I went on pre-season towards Portugal. Um, I played my first match for the club um, against the Portuguese Premier League side. And after the game, the manager started screaming and shouting in my face and there was spit going in my eye. And I thought to myself, do you know what? I cannot handle this. So I got up and I um, swore at him and I carried on walking away from the group. That evening I went down to dinner. Um, I sat there with the boys and the manager turned up and he said, Scott, he said, you're not eating with us. He said, you're not training with us. You're not socialising with us. He said, get back to your room, ring your agent um, and tell him to get you a flight home. So I rang my agent and I said, listen, I've had an argument with the manager. He's told me I'm never going to play for the club again, uh, even though I just signed a two-year contract on £1,500 a week. Um, I said, what do I do? He said, just stay there. He said, I'm sure he'll let you train by the end of the week, but he didn't. So what I did um, off the back of that is I took my mate's laptop that we were in the room together and I started to gamble, just thinking it was a normal thing to do. It passed the time of day. Um, I got back to England and I went around a uh, show home in Stoke Mandeville with my mum. And there was a plot one, two, one in the corner, which was a four bed townhouse. And my mum was saying to the show home owners, he saved up almost £32,000 um, with her help. Um, and I thought that's not true. I gambled away about £10,000 that week in Portugal. So I thought to myself, I've got a bit of a conundrum. Um, do I try and win the money back or do I just leave it? So I tried to win it back. From the first bet that I had in Portugal to 15 days later, I gambled £32,000 away, every single penny of it. 
because I was a gambling addict, but I was still in denial. I didn't want to admit it to myself. So I had said to my question yeah. come in. Um, yeah. Did you try to speak with any other players about the gambling? No, not at all. Do you know I, if anyone else was in a similar situation within within the group? No, it wasn't really a gambling culture at the club. Uh, there was previous to that when I was in the youth team, but when I actually moved into the first team, um, it, there wasn't much of it going on. And because I'd been away from the club for two years, I was almost like a new sign-in, so I didn't really know where to fit in. The only person that was my age that was still at the club was Ben Hamer, and you don't have much to do with goalies throughout the day, obviously, and they join in the matches at the end. Um, but the year below me, there was uh, Alex Pierce, Jem Kajan, Hal robson Kano, Simon Church, James Henry, uh, they had loads of them that were all together and they had quite a tight nucleus. So for me, I didn't know where I fitted in um, and I found that really, really difficult. Um, obviously, acceptance is, is huge in this day and age because you want to be accepted by everyone. Uh, you want to be liked by everyone. Um, but yeah, no, I, I found it really, really tough. So I was at Reading for seven years um, and I never went on one Christmas do. So I just didn't feel as though I sort of um, had that sort of bond um, which is which is crazy, really, because I've been at clubs where I've been on loan for a month or whatever. We've been on Christmas dues because it's been over Christmas. And I've actually uh, probably got on better with a lot of the players in a short period of time there, um, probably because I was a bit different from the rest. Um, the lads that were a year or two older than me, um, there's a few lads like Johnny Hayes um, and a few other Irish lads, they were, more, um, they were more my sort of era, I suppose. They were a bit sort of... Um, a bit sort of different in their ways. They were a bit more mischievous um, and not as professional. And that's probably why those players didn't do as well as the, the younger ones have. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, so, so I cut you off about yeah. talking about. No. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. So I had, I had to obviously come clean to my parents that I'd lost the £32,000 in 15 days. And I remember stood in my uh, mum and dad's living room um, and I started crying because that was the easiest way to sort of get anything out. Because if you're crying, people aren't going to shout at you as much. So, I told my mum and dad exactly what had happened. Um, and she said to me, you need to go and get help. So that night, I went to a Gamblers Anonymous meeting in Watford. Um, I didn't want to go to a local one to me because I was sort of ashamed or I was a bit anxious um, whether people would know me in my local one. And I didn't want them to know that I had an issue with gambling. So I travelled about 40 minutes. Um, I got there and the first guy that spoke had done a street robbery and taken uh, someone's Rolex to fund his gambling. And I thought, you're an absolute lunatic, mate. What am I doing here? So the second guy that spoke um, that had been stealing from work and cashing in checks, and I thought, you know what, I've heard enough. I thought to myself, I'm nowhere near as bad as these guys. I'd never do that. Um, so I actually left the room that night, and I wrote a letter on my granddad's life, and it said, on my granddad's life, I'll never gamble again. And I signed it, and I dated it. I didn't gamble for the next four days, which was the longest I didn't gamble for, 10 and a half years. And I was so proud of myself. I thought to myself, do you know what, that's some kind of like achievement. Um, the other four days is when I took my ex-girlfriend to Dubai for her 21st birthday, not knowing that when I got there, I couldn't gamble. And it was the worst four days of my life. It was, if I'd have known that now, um, I'd have taken her to Butlins. It'd have been a lot cheaper and a lot more enjoyable. Um, but yeah, that just shows how I sort of judged the niceties in life around gambling. Uh, being in Dubai should be a nice time, but it just wasn't. Yeah. Um, but yeah, while I was at Crawley, it was probably the worst part of my gambling. Um, there were times where my parents were looking after my bank card, like I said, they would leave me 20 or 30 pounds to get to training for a bit of fuel. We played Bolton uh, in the Carling Cup on a Tuesday night and they give me 100 pounds to uh, stay down there because it was about 85 miles each way. So I had training the following morning. Um, I'd, I'd spent the money in the afternoon uh, on the roulette before the game. Didn't think about the consequences. I ended up sleeping in my car for the next two nights because I had nowhere to stay. Um, I had no, um, no money to be able to get home. I didn't have any food. And that was the first time I got questioned about what I was up to. Uh, I went to training in my match day suit. And one of the lads turned around and he said, why have you got your suit on? But I didn't want questions because I knew that if questions came out, the truth would come out. Um, so I kind of batted it off um, and left it at that. I realized after that, though, I had training again the following day because I was in the bomb squad. Uh, I wasn't in the selected 11. Um, and as a punishment, we had to do an next day's training. So I ended up sleeping uh, in my car uh, at the service station behind a lorry with his back door open. And I thought to myself when I woke up that morning, what has my life become? And that was the, one of the first times I actually thought to myself, do you know what? For all the heartache and pain that I'm going through with this addiction, that was one of the low points. Um, and I thought to myself, I really do need to stop. I remember being in bed on a Sunday morning not long after, um, and I heard my mum scream at the front door. 
So I was thinking, like, what's she screaming at? What's going on here? And she ran up to my room and she burst open the door and she said, thank God you're in here. And I said, what do you mean? Like, what, what's going on? And she went, there's bailiffs at the door. I thought it was the police. Uh, they've basically turned up um, and asked, is this where you live? And I was just like, right. And I said, what, what's going on? I said, like, what do they want? They said, you owe £1,500 in, uh, in fines from uh, speeding ticket and parking tickets that I hadn't paid. So I couldn't afford to pay them. And it had amounted to £1,500, like I said. And I thought to myself, I haven't got £1,500 in my account, uh, which was a week's wages at the time. So I started to do things that I shouldn't have done uh, to try and make the money quickly. We played Cheltenham um, in, the, in the, one of the league matches. And I looked at the back four that day and I thought, you know what? We're not great. So I put £500 on my team to lose, which I'm not proud of. Um, at half time, I got pulled off by the manager 3-0 down. Um, at the end of the game, I'd won £2,000 to pay the debt. And I felt like a sense of relief. Um, but for me, that just shows the principles, morals, rules, regulations go out of the window um, when you're in the midst of this addiction. Because I look back now and think, how could I possibly have done that? I was jogging around out there on the pitch, not trying a leg, because I knew that this bill was more important to pay um, than getting three points. So that's how my professionalism started to take a knock off the back of the gambling. Um, there were other times at Crawley where I brought other people's lives into danger. Um, I used to travel home, which I said was 85 miles each way. And I needed to be stimulated. I needed that buzz. So I couldn't just sit there in silence or sit, listen to music. I found it dull. I found it boring. Um, so I used to gamble. I'd watch horse racing on my phone or play on the roulette. And I, on this occasion, I crashed into the side of a car. Um, we pulled over at a school in Stoke Mandeville, just close to where I live. I was almost home. Um, and the guy came bouncing out of his car towards me. And I thought, this is going to end in two ways. I either say sorry um, or it's going to end up with violence. So I stopped him in his tracks and I said, listen, I can, I can only apologise. And he said, what's happened? And I said, I think I've fallen asleep at the wheel. Um, I said, I play football. We had a, a double session today. I said, I'm just tired. I said, I can only apologise. Fortunately for me, I'd stuffed away money um, underneath my handbrake. There was like a bit of plastic that used to come up um, and I had 500 pounds in there. I pulled it out and I gave it to him. Uh, I looked in the back seat of his car and there was a kid sat in the car seat. I remember instantly just crying, thinking my sister, um, I just had a little boy who had just been born and I thought if the shoe was on the other foot, I'd have been absolutely furious. Um, and then when I realised I was bringing other people's lives to danger, I wasn't proud of myself because I knew deep down that I wasn't a bad person. I um, couldn't myself from this suspicious stuff I was in. Um, so yeah, it was, it was very hard during my time at Crawley. Um, it, was, it was a learning curve for me. Um, there were a lot of things there that I wasn't proud of. But can I ask you where whereabouts in your career are you at this stage? What, how old were you when you were at Crawley? I was 20, oh, so I signed there in 2011, so I was 23, um, 23, 24. So that season actually went really well. Um, we actually got promoted um, and we went up into League One. My wages went from 1,500 to 1,950 a week. And I got pulled into the um, to the chairman's office about three or four weeks into pre-season. Um, he'd had a conversation with my agent and it didn't go too well. And I wasn't sure of how it happened, but the um, the chief exec, the chairman, and, um, and a couple of other guys just said, listen, you're not going to play for us uh, this season. So I thought, I've played the whole back end of last season. Like, how is this possible? How's it happened? Um, but for one of the reasons it was, I was talking to one of the, the girls that worked at the club one day, um, and I didn't realise that there was a guy that worked at the club um, who had some sort of, uh, some sort of like to her, liking for her. Um, and off the back of that, he caught me twice talking to her um, in the reception area where we weren't allowed to go all of a sudden uh, where she worked. Um, and then a couple of days after, I got a phone call from my agent saying, listen, you're not going to play for the club ever again. So I, I suppose it tells you or teaches you not to talk to people um, that the hierarchy of football clubs like. But that's how cutthroat, um, that's how cutthroat it was. I hadn't done anything wrong. Um, and yeah, my career off the back of that uh, obviously took a, a downwards uh, spiral. Um, but I only found out that story about two months after I left. The girl actually rang me up and she said, you do realise um, like what's happened here? And I said, no. I said, like, what's, what's going on? When he's been sort of sending me flowers, we've been sitting outside my house. Um, you've obviously been caught talking to me twice when you're not allowed. And then all of a sudden you've been told you're never going to play for the club ever again. So what can I do? You can't prove anything. Um, you can't sort of ask him to change his mind because um, I'd already left the club. So, yeah, it was, it was very, very strange. Um, but he pulled me into the, the office at Christmas time, which was six months later, because I'd just been training every single day. I hadn't played any matches that year. And he said to me, how 
Austin, are you going to keep coming to training uh, without sort of like getting bored? When are you going to leave? And I said, I'm not going to leave. I'm on £1,950 a week. I said, I'm not going to get that elsewhere. So he pulled me in on December the 20th and said, listen, there's £28,500 to leave today. Um, I shook his hand and I drove home for Christmas. So I had a good Christmas with my sort of friends and family. Um, I went to the bank at the beginning of January um, with my parents. And I sat opposite my bank manager um, and I said, listen, I've got um, almost £20,000 here because I gambled away some of the money during the week uh, before that. Um, I said, I want to get a mortgage. And he sat there and he laughed and he said, how can I possibly give you a mortgage? He said, you've gambled £10,300 um, in the last 30 days looking at your bank account. He said, you live in your overdraft, you pay fees every month. He said, from tomorrow, you haven't got a job. So I thought, yeah, fair enough. My dad was in a privileged position that he just retired from the police. He had a pension. Um, and he basically trusted me to do the right thing. He said, if you can promise me to pay the mortgage, I'll get it in your uh, get it in my name for you. So I was just like, right, okay. I said, if you could. July that year, um, I moved into a two bed flat, um, and my dad and pa- well, my parents lent me between fifty and sixty thousand pounds. As simple as that. They paid for all my bills. They paid for my mortgage. They paid for my car. They paid for my car insurance. The nights out. I was going on nights out with my mum's bank card because I didn't have any money, um, and I was on two thousand pound a week, sort of a few months earlier. So. I needed to keep up that um, that reputation. I needed to keep up that sort of image that I had. Um, I thought that, or people thought, just because he drives a nice car, he's got a nice watch, um, he's got a nice wash bag, that I had money. I didn't have anything. Uh, I was completely skinned. Chris Wilder gave me an opportunity at Oxford. Um, he brought me into the club uh, in the summer. Um, he sat me down and said, listen, there's £800 a week. I know that we're one of your local clubs. And during that season, I really suffered with my mental health, um, not because football was going badly, but... There was one day in training where one of the lads turned around and he said, Scott, he said, you're absolutely killing us. And I looked at him and for the first time in my life, I felt numb and I thought, do you know what? I don't want to be a footballer. I don't want to have these boots on and I don't want to be in this environment um, because I felt so worthless. I felt so um, sort of devalued. And I looked at him and I didn't say anything. Um, I've done this talk at different football clubs um, since I've obviously come out of the game and he was in one of the sessions. And I said, do you remember at Oxford? I said, when you told me I was useless. He went, yeah, yeah, I said, so I do remember sort of having a bit of an argument. I just said, mate, I said, I sort of um, was suffering with depression at the time. Um, I said, but I didn't tell anyone. I said, but looking back now, I said, like, I just want to kind of apologise to the person that I was. So I had kind of a bit of a vendetta against him um, because I didn't think that he was my kind of person. He was very professional. Um, and I struggled to actually like people that were doing the right thing because I couldn't do that. Um, but at the end of that season, Gary Wadder could come in with a month to go. Um, as manager, so I hadn't had him for the fifth time. Um, he brought me in at the end of the season and said, "Listen, there's one game to go against. I think it was Plymouth away." Uh, he said, "You're not going to play." He said, "Because I know about you as anyway as a player. You know I like you." So I was just like, "Yeah, happy days." So what I did um, was basically relied on him. I trusted him to give me a new contract. Um, we booked tickets to go to Magaluf at the end of the season. Me and all the boys uh, from the football club. He pulled me into the office at the stadium, and I walked in there and I started laughing. And he didn't laugh back, and that was quite unusual for him. Um, and I thought, this isn't, this isn't normal. Um, and he said, Scott, he said, this is one of the hardest meetings I've ever had to have with a player. He said, but there's nothing here for you. He said, I can't, I can't do anything. Um, and that spoke volumes. I knew that as soon as he told me that there was nothing here for me, I had to kind of um, trust his opinion. I had to value his opinion because, listen, at the end of the day, even though he released me that day, he's still a very, very good bloke. He's a very good friend of mine. Um, yeah. But that, that basically told me where I was. So we went to Magaluf um, later on uh, that day. I remember being on the fl- uh, plane with the boys. We'd had a few drinks. We got to the hotel in Spain, um, and I went to pay for the taxi for me and two of the young lads. And I'd lost my wallet uh, on the plane. My last £500 of my life was in that wallet. Um, I got upstairs uh, into the hotel lobby, and one of the lads uh, called Alfie Potter turned around. He said, what a day you've had. You've got no wallet, and you've got no job. And for me, it just hit me for six. I didn't, obviously stand there and laugh like the other 10 lads were laughing. They were rolling around on the sofas, thinking it was the best banter in the world. Um, But I put a brave face and I went up to my room. I rang my mum, crying my eyes out yet again. And I just said, mum, I said, I've lost my wallet. I said, I've got no money. I said, I'm in the middle of New Yorker. And she said, listen, I'll try and show you some money. You can have a time away on me and your dad. Three hours later, four hours later, I was in a taxi on the way back to the airport and I was flying home because I refused. I said, I didn't want to be there. I needed to get out of it. Over the next few weeks, um, I was waiting for my phone to call. Um, I had a call from Cheltenham and Northampton. Um, the managers at both of those clubs had spoken to my agent and asked him if I had a gambling problem. And I was like, I like a bet, but no more than anybody else. 
Um, players got back to pre-season at professional clubs. I still had no phone call. Um, I was sat in Nando's and, and a manager from uh, Dunstable rang me called Tony Fontenelle. And I thought, I don't know who's ringing, but I picked it up and he said, it's Tony Fontenelle from Dunstable Town Football Club. Um, we'd like you to come down tonight so we can have a look at you. And I thought, why are you ringing me? There's no way I'm going to go and play for Dunstable. That was my immediate reaction because that's the, that's the kind of person I was. So I thought, do you know what? I've got no option. I had to go and play that night and we played against Temple Hempstead. And after the game, he said, listen, we'll give you £450 a week in an envelope. And I thought, right, OK. And I stood there, I shook his hand reluctantly um, and I signed for Dunstable. My first ever match for Dunstable uh, was in front of 87 people when sort of four years previous to this, I was playing in front of 45,000 at Newcastle away. And I couldn't accept it. I couldn't understand how it had happened. Um, I was on the sort of team bus um, and they were doing things that I'd never seen before in my life. And I thought to myself, do you know what? This isn't for me. Um, over the next few weeks, I started to bet on all my matches because I thought to myself, I'm now earning £450 a week, which wasn't enough to live. Um, my dad used to wait for me outside the ground each week. I'd give him the £450. He would go and pay that into my bank account and he'd open it up before he went and paid it in. He'd give me £20 and say, listen, mate, go and treat yourself to a takeaway tonight. And it became really, really tedious. So I turned into like Bear grills. I don't know if any of you have been to Dunstable, but there's one entrance to the ground. I used to walk the opposite way around the ground. I'd climb over a fence into people's gardens. So I'd run down the side of their garden to get out the front of their gate, run round to the front of the football club, get in my car and drive off. My dad would bring me every week and say, listen, where are you? I've been studying for an hour. And he said, you're still not out. He said, I've checked the bar. You're not in there. And I said, oh, I'm already on the way home. He said, right, come and drop the money around to me and your mum. There was no money. I'd been in William Hill down Dunstable High Street um, already. I'd lost the money. Um, so that meant, yet again, that they had to pay more of my bills. I was in the bookmakers uh, when I was playing for Dunstable. Um, one of the, the sort of like wake-up calls that I did have close to when I stopped. I went in there on a Sunday morning. My Super Sunday used to consist of 36 different bets. It used to cover my coffee table. It was nine bets along and it was four bets down. I had 36 individual sheets. And this guy stopped me in my traps, in my traps uh, and he said, Scott Davis, he said, is this you? And he turned his phone around and showed me a picture. And I was like, yeah, you can quite clearly see it's me. I was like, no one else is that good looking. And uh, he was like, listen, you shouldn't be betting on football. And I said, mate, I've been betting on football for years. And he said, well, that's why I've driven almost two hours to come in the shop today to see if you come in. He said, and you've come in. He said, you've done exactly what we expected. So I was thinking, don't tell me what I can and can't do. This is the bookmakers I come in every single day for nine years. So he talked to me like a parent or a teacher. And I thought to myself, I don't really like that. So he said, I'm not putting your bets on. And I said, listen, mate, I said, just, just put them on. I said, I don't care if I'm not allowed to bet on it. And he said, what part of no don't you understand? And I thought, I was like, don't talk to me like that. So I punched the screen in between me and him. I'm the least violent person in the world. Listen, if there's a fight kicking off, I'd rather hug it out and walk off. But yeah. I punched the screen um, in between me and him, and he got quite uh, nervous. He got quite upset. He put the bets on, and I walked out of the shop. As I was walking out of the shop, uh, one of the blokes in there chased me, um, basically just to catch up with me because I knew him because I used to see him in there quite regularly. And he said, listen, mate, he's just called the police. Um, so I'd basically hurry up and get yourself home. So I was like, right, okay. I expected the police to come and knock on my door um, or the FA to get in touch with me, but luckily they never did. On the 8th of June 2015, which was uh, a few months later, I joined Wildstone um, in probably February that year. Um, I was in the bookmakers betting on Goodwood, uh, Glorious Goodwood, which was a horse racing event. I just put a bet on um, £100 on a horse called Lady Felia, and it won at 7-2. to two. So I went over to collect my money at the till, um, and Helen and Jenny, my two best mates that were behind the till, two middle-aged women that I knew more about their lives than I knew about my own. I knew more about their lives than I knew about my family's lives. Um, because I'd speak to them, I'd buy them lunch and sit down and eat it with them. They weren't giving me the attention that I craved. And I thought to myself, why are they ignoring me? Like, why are they looking over my shoulder? And what happened after that is I turned around, I looked at the door, and I saw my mum in floods of tears crying her eyes out. And when I went, got to the door, I said to my mum, I was just like, are you all right? Um, and she said, no. She said, you need to stop gambling. You're going to end up dead or you're going to break up mine and your dad's marriage. And that really, really hit home for me. So I went home that night. Um, and I laid in the dark for the next 24 hours. I didn't speak to anyone. No one checked up on me to check that I was okay. Um, and I thought to myself, do you know what? I don't like this life anymore. I started cooking these chicken burgers. Um, these bird's eye chicken burgers get four for a pound in a box. And I did the most stupid thing I'd ever done in my life. That I held a knife to my chest. And that's not normal behavior. Um, I knew that when I did that, that I'd hit my bo rock bottom and I needed help. Um, I started twisting it around underneath my peck and scratching around. Um, and straight away, I was quite fortunate that I was one of the ones that realised it wasn't normal. Um, I went downstairs, I got in the car, I went to my mum's house, 
I said to my mum, listen, I need help. I said, I've finally given up. And she said, thank God you finally admitted it. The following day, she put me in touch with a rehab clinic called Sport and Chance, which was set up by Tony Adams. Um, I went down there and I set up a guy. And he said, we're going to try and work out whether you need one-to-one. Um, so I just turn my light on. Yeah, go for it. Better Sorry, chaps. Um, so, yeah, he basically said to me, listen, we're going to work out whether you need one-to-one counselling um, or 26 days residential, so you have to pack your bags and move in. So he sat there and he could tell that I was absolutely petrified. Um, and after about 15 minutes, he looked at me with a little wry smile and he said, yeah, he said, you're a mess. He said, you need 26 days. So I was just like, right, yeah, I thought I might. I went and told my manager at the time um, through football. I said to him, listen, I'm going to miss pre-season. Um, I'm going away for 26 days. And his words to me were, oh, well, that's not ideal, is it? And I said to him, listen, I said, like, I've told you the reason why I'm going away. So I need to go and do it. I said, because it's wrecking my life and it has done for 10 years. And that was the response I expected the whole time throughout football. And that's probably why I kept it to myself. Yeah. Yeah. So that's probably why I kept it to myself. 6th of July, 2015, um, I packed my bags. I drove around the M25 and down the A3 to a place called Lip Hook in Hampshire. Um, and when I got there, I was completely exhausted. I cried the whole way and I thought to myself, do you know what? I thought what um, rehab was for people like Amy Winehouse and Pete Doherty. I didn't believe it was for people like me. Something that started out as a little bit of fun, developed into a problem and then developed into addiction. I didn't realise gambling could do that to you. I sat down on the first day, having met the three other lads that were attending the course. Uh, one was a footballer, uh, one was a rugby league lad, and one was a rugby union lad. One was in there for gambling and two were in there for alcohol. So I sat opposite the counsellor on the first day and he said, right, tell me what's been going on. And I was thinking, mate, there's no way I'm going to talk to you. After the second or third day, I thought to myself, do you know what? I'll open up a little bit more, but I'm still not going to tell you the truth. Um, and then after a week or so, I thought, do you know what? I feel so much better. I've been talking, I've been honest, I've been open. Um, and I didn't get judged for it. I felt as though he was built, building this exterior that was going to be unbreakable. And that's exactly what he did and what he has done because I haven't had a bet now for nearly five years. But on the 21st day, one of the hardest things that I'd ever had to listen to in my life, um, my parents came in, they sat in a room with me, the counsellor, my sister was there with my brother-in-law as well. And the counsellor said to me, listen, Scotty, tell them, uh, tell them everything. So I just said, this isn't going to be nice to listen to. So I said everything that I needed to tell my parents, get all the sort of resentment off my chest, the lies that I told. And my mum was sat there behind crying eyes and she just said to me, how could you do that to me? And I was like, I'm so sorry. My dad then said, right. He said, from today, he said, if you do not stop gambling, he said, it's as simple as this. Me and your mum are going to disown you. And I sat there and I thought, how has this happened? I thought, I cannot believe the people that I love most in my life that have brought me into this world have said it. And I looked across at the counsellor and the counsellor was kind of sat there nodding his head. And I thought he's obviously been the one that's told them to say that. And for me, it was probably the best thing I ever heard because I knew that I couldn't go back to being the Scott that I was. Um, and it was what I needed. It was a kick up the backside. Um, and that sits with me every time that I think about gambling in the early days that I did. I thought to myself, do you know what? Do I need a bet as much as I need my mum and dad? No. Um, they were the best medicine that I could have ever asked for. And that's the best medicine that I ever got given um, along with talking. When I came out of there, um, I got a pen um, on the 8th of, Ju- 8th of September at a Gamblers Anonymous meeting. And on this pen, it said, congratulations, you've reached 90 days without a bet. And I was flicking it around at home. And I was like, what do I do with this pen? And I was so ashamed that I'd gone to rehab that I thought, you know what? I'm over it now. I want people to basically get better if they need my help. So I put it onto uh, Facebook and there was about 1,300 likes and about 300 comments. And people saying, how did you stop gambling? My husband's got a problem. My son's got a problem. And I thought, you know what? I'm not the only one. So after a while, I actually found sort of a sense of relief and a, a sense of satisfaction that other people were struggling to because I thought I can help them. And that's what I did. I then got approached by um, Sporting Chance, which was the rehab clinic to go and tell my story. I did it at Norwich City for the first time in my life. And I was absolutely in bits before I was doing it. I remember driving there, uh, sweating, I had a headache, thinking, what am I doing? Going back into a football club, talking to players that I know, um, telling them my story when some of the amounts just don't add up from what they were earning. They were in the Premier League at the time, on sort of like 50 grand a week, some of them. Um, But someone once told me it's relative to what you earn, um, to what you gamble. And I was like, right, I need to remember that. So if I'm losing 800 pound a week on 1,000 pound a week and he's losing 16,000 pound a week on 20,000, it's still 80%. And that's the way I needed to to figure it out so I did it I did the talk and it went down really well um, and I loved it I loved it after and I thought you know what I want to do this more often 
I ended up becoming the public speaker for the rehab clinic. Um, I was chatting at an event up in London. Um, there was loads of MPs and stuff in sport there. And a guy came and approached me and he said, listen, um, I've got a company up north called Epic Risk Management. Um, we've got a new project to go around to all the uh, football clubs for the next five years. We need to go to every club once a season for five years. And I want you to run it. And that is the biggest positive that I've ever taken out of this is now that I've turned it into a job, which I absolutely adore. It connects me within football. I still get to go and see all the lads um, and stuff like that. So I've well, done all this. A couple of questions yeah. from people that might link into this. Um, yes, please do. Obviously, you, you, you've, uh, you've talked a lot about there, but there's um, a couple of questions where reflecting is there one thing that you would do differently or tell a, your younger self? Oh, to be more honest, to, be, to probably show more of a sign of weakness, I never got told from a young age, but I always thought from a young age that if I had any problems, you bottle them up and you deal with them yourself, um, because that's what blokes do. That's one of the, the my best, my favourite phrases, I guess, that that's what blokes do. It's just the norm. I've never been in a football environment where I've said to a lad in the morning before training, how are you, mate? And he's gone, actually, mate, I'm not feeling that great. Yeah. It just doesn't happen. Um, whereas now, I probably um, instilled it into my mates that if there is anything wrong, you make sure you pick up that phone and you talk to me. I'm not qualified to deal with problems, but I'm qualified to talk, as we all are. All right, we've all been given a voice. You can all give your opinion, whether it's the right one or the wrong one. Or at times, you don't even need to give an opinion. You don't need to give advice. You can just listen. Um, so for someone to say it to get it off their chest... Um, could be the most important thing. I would like to think now that if I had the same opportunity again, I was given the same money again, the same environment, had the same opportunity already with the same people, I'd like to think that I would hand over my finances. Um, that would probably have been one of the things that I could have controlled better, um, which probably, probably would have enabled me um, or disabled me to gamble. Um, because as a young lad, you think... Is it a bit about knowing that? Were you in that space of mind? Did you know that that would that have helped? Like, would you well, have ever have done that? Do you know, one of the things that sticks out with me is I played a match for Wickham against Southampton. And after the game, I got Adam Lardner's shirt and I gave it to my mate. And he was like, are you sure? And I was like, yeah, yeah. I was like, you have it. I said, like, you're a Southampton fan. And I said, I'll get it off him next time I play against him. And our careers were at that time, we were kind of level. And his went up and mine went down. And I never played against him ever again. And that, that sticks with me so much. And I just thought to myself, we were kind of on a pie. Every time we played against each other, we had a good game. Like, it was never, um, like, no one ever got the better of each other by a lot. But we played against each other throughout the whole of our academy days, and it was a good battle. Um, and that was my mindset. I thought that this was just going to last forever. I thought to myself, do you know what? I'm in football now. The money's going to come. It's only going to get bigger. It's only going to get better. Um, but it didn't. And to lose or to let go of your dream to stop doing it at 26, 27, and then to find something else that, um, that's uh, adequate enough, I suppose, and that you enjoy as much, it's just yeah. impossible. It's just impossible because you've lived your dream. So how do you go from living your dream to going into another job? Um, but for me, what I do now is the closest thing to it, and, that, and that's hand on heart, I can honestly say that. But I had like a two-year period where I was building beds. Like, so obviously when I came out of rehab, I needed to rebuild my life. Um, I was quite fortunate that PFA funded me to do a university degree. Um, so I did that from home to kind of fill that void of gambling every day that I gave me something to focus on. Um, luckily for me, um, she's in the next room. I don't know if she's listening, but I was swiping away on all these dating websites. Um, and I came across my missus. So I didn't know she was going to be a missus at the time. Um, but since I've met her, I've been in su such so much of a better headspace because I've got someone alongside me that sees everything that I, does now, uh, everything that I do now. Someone said to me the other day, if you'd have met her when you were 21, do you think it'd have been different? Yeah, I do. Uh, because as a young lad and you're free to do whatever you want, it's just a nightmare. It's a recipe for disaster. And we've got that relationship now that if there is anything going on um, or I need to speak to about anything, we've got that. It's a safe place to go to. Even though I had that with my parents, it felt like it was too close to home. Um, Dave knows what my dad's like. He's the best guy in the world, but he's quite a big bloke. He's quite, listen, we just get on with it. We're blokes. Um, but it was only a couple of years after I came out of rehab, he texted me when he was on holiday, having read Tony Adams' book called Addicted. And he texted me saying, listen, he said, I've just read the book and I completely understand what you went through now. Um, he basically said, oh, I want to say I'm sorry and I love you. And I was just thinking, like, he's never, ever said that to me in my life. Um, but he said it because he couldn't understand how I could part ways with, I don't know, one, two, three, four thousand pound a day. He could put five pound bet on 
uh, lose it and it would break his heart because that's the kind of person he, he was. We had different values of money. Um, but when I did come out of rehab, like I said, I met Hannah. Um, we got engaged a couple of months ago, which is great. Um, I filled that void with, with obviously, um, going to university. Um, obviously, playing for Slough now has been brilliant. Um, I love football now as much as I ever have because I obviously play with a clear mind. Got no worries going on in the world. Um, I enjoy it as much as I ever have. But the thing that I had to rebuild was the relationship with my mum. Um, and that probably took a longer time than, than all of it. She said to me a month after I came out of rehab, I feel like I finally got my son back. And I remember standing in the kitchen and I said to her, like, listen, don't be stupid. I've been here the whole time. And she turned around to me and she said, what does your sister do for work, Scott? And I didn't know the answer. And I should know the answer because it's my sister. But I hadn't given my family anywhere near as much attention as I should have. And my sister had a little boy at the time who I didn't spend any time with. I didn't give any sort of attention to. Um, and that really sort of made me think about how much my life had been taken over by gambling. Um, but in the end, like you say, it's, it's gone from being something where uh, I was going to sleep at night crying, worried about health health anxiety was another thing I really struggled with. I don't know if you've got guys that you've spoken to before, but my health anxiety was through the roof. I used to live on Google. If I had a pain in my finger or my foot, um, I would Google it. I'd cry myself to sleep, diagnose it. Um, because of that, that self-worth was so low. Um, and I was just waiting for something else bad to happen in my life. Yeah. Um, but obviously going to rehab was the best thing that, that ever happened to me in the weirdest of ways. So I've got, we've got loads of questions here. So I'm just yeah, going to feel free. Up. Yeah, no. Was, um, so a couple here, I'm just going to put it together. Was there, was there one instance that, that, that pushed you to, towards therapy? Uh, and another one that's come in quite a lot is what are the strategies that you now use for coping with stress, anxiety, um, gambling. Um, yeah. What are those things that you've now got in place that could help people? Because right now we may be going into a period of self-isolation. Boredom is going to be a massive one for those who aren't working. Can't yeah. Work yeah. So right. yeah, for me, as soon as I realised that I was making my mum ill, um, which I was, my dad was messaging me, ringing me in the middle of the night, saying, "Listen." Um, your mum's downstairs again, three, four o'clock in the morning, Googling, how can I help my son with a gambling addiction? And as soon as I knew that she was doing that, I thought to myself, oh, this needs to stop because I can't have my mum uh, obviously suffering as well with her mental health. And she was down because of it. She wasn't sleeping at night. She was worried sick. And the time that the bailiff turned up at my house, she actually thought that it was the police to tell her that I'd snuck out in the middle of the night and done something stupid um, because she was so worried about my state of mind. Um, so it'd been going on for a a lot long, well, a much longer time than than just that time at, at the end when it stopped. Um, so yeah, I needed to stop really for for myself. But I look back now and I probably stopped because of my mum, and she knows that. Listen, like she knows I don't gamble anymore, um, and we've had good chats uh, around it about what happened and stuff. Um, see you later, Bob. Cheers, mate. It's just popped up. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's been great. Um, but in terms of coping strategies, um, I have to feel that time that I used to gamble, that used to give me that rush, that excitement of scoring a goal. Um, and have I replaced it? I don't know. Um, obviously, I, I probably appreciate more now what I've got in life than what I did back then. Um, what I do do is I'll watch horse racing every single day still, which is, is crazy to think, but I watch it because I enjoy it. I'll start with a thousand pounds on a piece of paper. So there's no actual cash. I just write a thousand pounds at the top. And I write down every single bet that I would have done and I revisit it on a Sunday at the end of the week and just realize how much money I would have lost. Um, so for me, it's a good reminder as to why I don't do it. Um, but at the same time, a lot of people wouldn't recommend it. I turn to walking quite a lot. I listen to music uh, at the beginning when I stopped gambling. Um, I did meditation uh, in, in um, rehab. There was one Saturday morning where I was tied, walking, uh, blindfolded, walking around a field, leading a horse to build, uh, talk about trust building exercises. So every time um, the horse made a noise, I knew that there was an obstacle in front of me. So it meant I had to basically jump in the air, jump over the obstacle, because um, the horse, I put my trust in the horse. So it's just such a weird thing to do. Um, but I remember that being a Saturday morning, um, thinking the boys are going to be out basically playing a match and there's me walking around holding the horse with a blindfold on. But it seemed to work. Um, but I honestly believe if you've got a problem, go and share it. Um, a problem shared is a problem half, and um, it's the best thing you can ever do. I say, I see there's a few more questions popping up, just one last thing. I say to a lot of players now, if you pull your hamstring, you immediately go to the physio, all right, and you say, I've pulled my hamstring, like, and you go and get help. If you break your leg and you fall off a climbing frame at home, you go to A&E. 
if you've got something else going on in your mind upstairs, you don't speak about it. And it's the most dangerous thing to not speak about. That is the most powerful part of your body. And we don't offload. So why would you have something going on up here, which is an injury in itself, if you've got something going on um, that can obviously be detrimental to your health? But it's crazy to think that we don't speak. Um, so that's why I say to a lot of players now when I go to these places and go to schools as well, um, some of the players come up to me after and go, when you mentioned about offloading, about going to see the physio for your hamstring and not speaking about what's going on up here, you said that's really hit home with me. And that's what gets a lot of them talking um, because it can be dangerous, obviously, from um, what I went through when I was younger with my best mate. Um, I, I don't want anyone to go through that um, because it's, it's just obviously really, really upsetting and really painful. Indeed. I've just um, popped a few things. Um, I'm just going to very quickly go through. I, by no means, are, uh, are we uh, professional mental health um, um, work as professional therapists, but there is in this time a few top tips that have been been given by the Heads Together campaign, which is one of the FA. I know the exercise is obviously um, a big part of what we've talked about. Um, so obviously talking about it and these are some of the things that are currently still open at this time every county has a um, um access to their therapeutic practice so um the one in berkshire is uh, um partners in talking therapies but each county does have one and their phone and their video and telephone presentation samaritans and i will forward all this presentation so you do have all this information um, and then right now, self isolation and working from home, routine, routine, and self care really. Uh, so um, another great thing um, is the grassroots football podcast um, for, for anyone who's out there. Um, Box and Box Chef Bay is a great one with Mark, who was here at the beginning. Um, uh, link. There is a great podcast on mental health that will be going out early next week. Um, or, or sometime in the next week or so. Please do look out for that, and the, the, the link is there. We do have a couple of questions, but if anyone does happen to want to talk to Scott, feel free to type them in or let me know. I'll you. I'm going to quickly go on to one here um, regarding was there any support available at clubs, such as player liaison officers, or for someone to speak to, or when you were uh, young and you took money, who could have offered more advice? There is now, um, so player liaisons um, at clubs are, are a lot more uh, frequent. Um, I, I couldn't even tell you if we had one at Reading. I don't believe that we did. Um, if I'd have known there was one, would I have gone and spoken to them? Probably not, because I wouldn't have trusted people to have kept it to themselves. I would have believed that they would have gone and told the manager, um, and that's the last thing that I wanted to happen. I didn't want the manager to find out. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of these clubs now um, that I do speak to, I go around to, they'll have player liaison officers, um, and some of them actually lose their job because they see it as an unnecessary um, like wage that's going out each month. Apparently, the players, the players don't access it enough. Um, so I actually spoke to one uh, lady who was doing that at a championship club, who lost their job. Um, the players would much rather talk to someone who's been through the mill, um, who's got a lived experience story like myself. So they would be more comfortable coming to speak to me after a session um, than they would going to speak to a, a middle-aged lady who's, who's never placed a bet in her life because they understand how we work. Um, a lot, a lot of players uh, get in touch with me and just basically say, listen, I need to chat um, because it's getting out of hand or I'm struggling with this. I've been in schools this year where we've had 13, 14 year olds opening up to me about self-harming. Um, and I said, have you told your parents yet? And they said, no. Um, so straight away, it makes me feel, um, it, yeah, it, it breaks me. I remember driving back around the M25 from school about three or four months ago, um, just in bits. Like, I'm not saying I was crying my eyes out, but I had enough sort of um, tears in my eyes just thinking, like, this can't be happening. Um, but, yeah, the, the fact that they opened up to me is great because then we can then get them the help that they need. That kind of leads on to uh, the last question I see here is, um... Do you think the culture within football now encourages lads to talk? Do you think clubs need to do more to support? I, what we try and do, or what I try and suggest, is that I think there should be someone, whether it's someone um, internal or external, every single month, every single player should have half an hour with this person just to talk about how their month's been, any issues they may have, because they don't realise the power of it and how effective it can be. Um, a lot of players have never spoken. And to, not, to have been, never have spoken, you won't ever know the benefits or um, how you can reap the rewards from speaking. 
So I do believe half an hour a month is not a lot of time. Uh, whether these players sort of went in for half an hour in the morning, half an hour in the afternoon. Um, and I think for a lot more of them, a high percentage of them would actually enjoy it because even though they're these superstars that we put on this pedestal, they're only human. They'll be going through the same issues like we all are, all right? whether they've got bereavements in their family, financial issues, divorce. It could be anything. Um, they still have these same problems. So, um, yeah, the, I think they really do need to talk, um, especially with it being such a, um, a an environment where it's kind of known for macho men um, that, that don't speak. Uh, it just seems ludicrous. Yeah. Um, and I just... I, I... I want to thank you very much. I don't know if anyone else has got any more questions, but if you if you do just add it into the chat, I will I will ask you Scott before we we, we end tonight. We have run over slightly, but it's just because it was obviously. No, that's fine. I was gonna say if people did want to unmute or whatever and ask question, then feel free. Yeah, so I don't mind at all. Us. If anyone does want to quickly ask a question, please do unmute yourself um, and, and and go for it. So they've had enough of me now, haven't they? 75 <laughs> minutes, done. Hi, oh, Scott. Oh, yeah. Hello. It's Richard here, mate. You all right? Hi, um, mate. Very well, thanks. Good stuff. Great great to hear you, by the way. Really uh, honest chat and uh, much appreciated. Um, in terms of like, mental health now, and you say you're at Slough Town, do you feel that as more of, uh, more of the players will confide, not just in you, but to each other if they're they're any mental health? Well, we had um, we had Simon Dunn that was obviously been public, so I can talk about it. Um, who halfway through the season this year actually just said, "Do you know what? He's exhausted. Um, his sort of anxiety before games, his nervous energy was taken over, um, and he needed a break." And that was nothing to do with the change room or anything like that. It's such a lovely change room to be in. Like all the lads are really well um, in terms of their behaviours and stuff. There, it's not a, a nasty group. Um, we're a really quite tight knit group as well. So when it happened, um, we were all really surprised. Um, but I saw one day I actually spotted something which I've mentioned to him since. Um, he came into the change room one day and he didn't shake anyone's hand. He just went straight to his peg, and that's really abnormal in a change room for that to happen. Um, and then it was only a week later or so he mentioned that he was struggling, and I just saw that sign in him. Um, and I just said to him, "Listen, you can open up to me. You can speak to me because I'm that kind of person. I have to deal with this thing." Um, Monday to Friday, my job, and I've had a few good chats with him over the last couple of months, um, and he's getting back on the on the straight and narrow, and he feels a lot better. But sometimes you just do need that breather away from football because it's exhausting. Um, whether it's on the pitch, off the pitch, um, it's a lifestyle that's quite uh, pretty much a roller coaster, I guess, of emotions. Um, but I would like to think now that anyone can open up to me. Um, I've got a lot of young lads that are football fans jumping in my inbox on Facebook, on Twitter, and things like that, saying. Um, I've seen your story, I've read your story, is there any chance for a, uh, a phone call? So I spend half my time travelling to these clubs, but I'm on the phone to 17-year-olds in Peterborough, 18-year-olds in Margate, whoever it may be that I've never met. Um, but, yeah, listen, I'm not saying that I'm a hero or anything like that, but I just want to help as many people as I can. I've got one last question, a little bit of a yeah. one uh, for yeah. you. And it, it, it came in uh, on a pre uh, registration form is, uh, why do you keep embarrassing goalkeepers across the country by swimming <laughs> in your own half? Um, no, I've uh, done two in two games, haven't I? Now? The last two games have started, yeah. Um, do you know what? It's something that I've always relied on my ability to, my technical ability um, has always been pretty good. I've um, been quite fortunate that because uh, I was younger, I used to live with those kick masters. I don't know if you ever remember the balls on the head of a dog league that used to get in the net. So I, I, everyone had computer games and stuff when we were younger, um, and I would just boot that for eight, nine hours a day. And people used to say to me, oh, how do you kick it so hard or kick it so far when we were at, at eight or nine? And I think it was just practice. Um, but I've been quite fortunate that my right foot's done me okay over the years. Um, I tried it, obviously, a few weeks ago, and it came off, and I tried it again on my birthday this year, and it came off again. So, um, yeah, no, it's, it's great. Um, but I probably should have scored more goals in the last couple of years anyway. So, Brilliant. Um... <laughs> I, I just want to mention this quickly because um, there's a great video with with you and Rain, Wayne Rooney. It's a very powerful thing. It must have actually been fairly recent because I know he was in Derby. Yeah, December the 16th. Wow. Is there one thing from speaking with Wayne or with your own experience that you would kind of like to, to, to end the talk on? Yeah. I recommend everyone to go see that video because it's 
Yeah, it, so it's on Wayne Rooney's Instagram. It's on his Twitter. Uh, so if you did watch it, it's called uh, Staying in Control. Um, so I was approached by 32 Red, um, which is a betting company, and they wanted me to do a series of three videos with Paddy Brennan, who's a jockey, Carl Frampton, who's a boxer, and Wayne Rooney. Um, and when it came up, I was obviously thinking, what's it going to entail? Um, but I went and spoke to him, and me included, I had this um, preconceived idea, this, this perception that he was going to be um, quite arrogant, full of himself, because that's what we read in the papers. But when I spoke to him, I think it made me realise that he's just a human, um, that he does have his own issues, that he did have his own issues. Um, and he basically said how important it is to speak up. He didn't feel as though he could speak to anyone other than his wife. Um, but he obviously went through situations with his, within his, um, his life where the papers had put things in um, to print uh, that involved his wife. So I think he at times obviously felt quite trapped um, in terms of um, not having anywhere to turn to. So it can be anyone. It doesn't discriminate, uh, whether it's you're black or white, you're male or female, you're from a broken home, a dysfunctional family. You can come from anywhere. All right? These issues arise um, off the back of a lot of times something that might have happened. It might happen off the back of trauma. Um, but I'd like to think that being on here tonight, if people did want to reach out to me just for a chat, um, I'm not saying I'm professional. I can solve all your problems. But if it makes you feel better, um, then it makes me feel better. So, um, yeah, like you say, I think from speaking to him, um, it shows that it can happen to anyone. Thank you very much. Um, just a final, does anyone have any last question for, for Scott before we end tonight's, tonight's event? Um, Scott, I want to thank you very much for this. It, it, at this time, obviously, it, mental well-being is, is massively important. So. We are going to record this. Um, it is going to be available for people to continue to um, to record. But I want to thank you for your time. And, um, and no, thank you. Um, I was going to say it's my my pleasure coming on. Um, if I can do anything in the future for any of you, just give me a shout. Um, so yeah, the more help, the merrier. Thank you very much, everyone. Cheers. Um, that thank is you. The end of today, we are going to do another session um, in. May and um, Dan Rook at Reading FC uh, may be in touch um, with more details of that. So please do look out on our Twitter on Reading FC Community Trust, um, our, who are very much a, a massive partner of us in delivering this. So thank you very much to everyone at Reading FC. Um, we do hope to see everybody soon at the Majesty Stadium. That's obviously what we do do. Usually we meet in person with a cup of tea and watch a five and a half hour match. Unfortunately, we can't do that right now. But I want to thank you and uh, everybody. Thank you. Jonathan. Yes. I've got a quiz uh, in five minutes. I'll give you a bell in the morning. I'll give you a call. We'll have a catch up. Yeah. yeah? All right. Brilliant. Thank you very Cheers. much. No, right. Cheers. Bye bye bye.